to go including this one on sexual offending so obviously this week we'll be talking about sexual offending next week we're going to be talking about a particularly sensitive topic so we'll focus on racism within the justice system as well as anti-racist practices that we as citizens can engage in to hopefully help to address not just the overrepresentation of black indigenous and other people of color in the justice system but in general help to address questions about marginalization and oppression of these different groups. So it'll be a pretty sensitive topic next week. And then I'm going to give you a bit of a break. Instead of doing another lecture in the final week, I'm just going to do a review for the final exam. So we'll talk about all of the lectures that have happened post midterm. So for today's class on sexual offending, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we need better research methods and better research to come to an understanding of sexual offenders and their likelihood of continued sexual offending over the life course. So are individuals that perpetrate sexual offenses in fact different from people that do not perpetrate sexual offenses and what might this mean for treatment strategies, intervention strategies, and so on. As a bit of a shameless plug, I wrote a book with some colleagues that deals with a lot of the themes that are discussed in today's lecture. So if you find things interesting today and you wanted to take a deeper dive into this information, it's such an expensive book. I wouldn't even recommend buying it as a student, but I think the library will have it available. So I'll post a photo and post a link for you to find it from the library. And so if you are interested in this material, I definitely recommend that you check it out. And this is again a, a very sensitive topic and I can often come across people who don't understand why we would even bother to conduct research on persons that have committed a sexual offense. And I can understand why people would have this perspective. It's very easy to view individuals that have perpetrated these crimes as very dangerous, their offenses are horrific, cruel, callous. And so why should we care about things like rehabilitation, treatment, or anything like that? People might say, like, why would you be on the side of people who are committing a sexual offense? And my argument is that you don't even necessarily need to have empathy for these individuals to actually begin to study them. Because one of the things that we want to try and do is we want to try and prevent harm to future victims. So it's not just about trying to study sexual offending to understand the sexual offender and how they should be punished. Rather, it also includes thinking about what is the best way to respond to these individuals so that they do not commit an offense in the future. And so sometimes we might conclude things such as sex offender registries are not actually helpful to prevent sexual offending. Or we might conclude that sexual offenders are less likely to perpetrate a new sex offense compared to individuals that have a long history of non-sexual offending. People could look at these findings and say like, this sounds like you're protecting persons that have perpetrated a sexual offense. And my response is it's not about protecting them. It's about, from my perspective, my goal as a researcher is to figure out the ways that we can actually prevent people from experiencing harm and victimization. I'll recommend whatever my research findings are telling me. So if my findings are indicating that a sex offender registry is actually increasing somebody's likelihood to continue to offend in the future, I'm going to share these findings even if it sounds like we're being quote unquote soft on crime or 
not being tough enough on individuals that have perpetrated a sex offense. Why be tough on crime if that is actually going to increase the likelihood that somebody is going to continue to commit crime in the future? So it can be very popular in the general public if you're tough on crime, especially in the United States. And so for me, the question is, well, what if getting tough on crime actually increases the likelihood that someone's going to offend in the future? And if that's true, then we're creating more harm towards victims. We're not protecting victims. We're not helping people avoid being victimized sexually or victimized in other ways. So we need to pay attention to what the research is actually saying about persons involved in sexual offenses. That way we can find the best way to intervene. So the layout of the lecture will proceed as follows. First, we'll just take a look at what sexual offending is and some of the core characteristics of persons that engage in sexual offenses. We'll talk a little bit about typologies of sexual offending, so different both theoretical perspectives or typological models that have been used to try to explain the heterogeneity of persons that have perpetrated a sex offense. Then we'll look at some of the unique risk factors for sexual offending, including paraphilia. So we'll talk specifically about pedophilia as a particular type of paraphilia. Then we'll look at offending patterns of persons that have been involved in sexual offenses. So what is their likelihood of continuing to sexually offend? Are the majority of individuals perpetrating a sex offense persons with a history of a sexual offense? So the question is, is what, a person always going to be at risk of sexual offending. And finally, in line with some of the textbook material, we'll touch on a different topic, which is family violence and victimization to begin to understand, for example, intimate partner violence. So respect to definitions and describing sexual offending, so the Criminal Code of Canada will lay out the different types of sexual offenses, and we have different categories of sex crimes. Often what happens is people will think about sexual offending typically in more traditional types of sexual offenses, like date rape is maybe the one that's more commonly thought about, but there is a wide range of different types of sexual offenses. We can look at sexual offenses against children. We can look at child pornography. We can look at sex offenses perpetrated over the internet. We could begin to consider things like living off the avails of prostitution as a type of sex offense. So that's not to say that individuals that engage in prostitution are involved in sexual offenses. What it's saying is that individuals that coerce others to engage in prostitution and then take funds or take a cut of a person's earnings while engaging in the sex trade, that could be an example of a sexual offense because you're essentially coercing somebody to engage in sexual behavior, therefore they don't have the ability to consent to this behavior. We can see sexual offenses that are perpetrated in nursing homes where individuals are taking advantage of people who cannot consent, not just because of things like drugs and alcohol, but because they're too young to consent, they're too old to consent, or they're living with a sort of disability that does not allow them to actually form consent. So there are different types of sexual offenses, and there are also a lot of different types of individuals that engage in these sexual offenses. So some people will think of individuals that sexually offend as being sexually deviant, like they have to have some certain deviant sexual preferences or orientations, and this is why they commit sexual offenses. Another perspective that emerged really in the 1960s and 1970s coming from different feminist theories and lines of discourse argued that sexual offenses were a form of dominance. They were a way to maintain the patriarchy. So some feminist scholars even argued that all men seek to rape women all the time, and that all sexual offenses are simply a way to maintain dominance over women. So I think this is probably an oversimplification of things, but it did help shift focus from just this purely sort of psychological perspective on sexual deviancy to also looking at things like patriarchal attitudes and the structure of society and that how that can contribute to the subjugation of women and their increased likelihood of victimization. Others, especially in the 1990s, began to fear the child sexual offender predator. These individuals were viewed as cold, callous, calculating, and they would prey upon vulnerable victims due to features of psychopathy. Over history, 
there have been different perspectives on sexual offending. So it could be the psychiatrization of sexual offending, where we're looking at sexual deviancy, then the feminist perspectives on sexual offending, and then psychopathy-based perspectives on sexual offending. Even now, with things like the Me Too movement, we've begun to understand that sexual offenses aren't just perpetrated by these individuals who made, like, you would cross the street if you saw them, because they just, they fit the profile of somebody who maybe you didn't think they were gonna commit a sexual offense, but an offense in general. Now we've been looking at individuals in positions of power and how they use this power to coerce individuals. So I think what this is all saying is that there's really no one way or word to describe sexual offenders. We need to look at them as a heterogeneous group. One of the things to think about right off the bat is one of the biggest misconceptions about individuals that have perpetrated a sexual offense. And that misconception is that individuals that have perpetrated a sex offense are at a high risk of continuing to sexually offend. So this, it's this idea of once a sex offender, always a sex offender. And the reality is that the vast majority of individuals that perpetrate a sex offense do not actually recidivate. Only about 10% of individuals that sexually offend go on to sexually recidivate. So we have to think about where this misconception comes from. The media is partly to blame because they tend to focus on the most severe cases and this gives the public a frame of reference. So when the public hears about sexual offenses, they're usually hearing about these extreme cases and that informs their knowledge of sexual offending. So it's not very generalizable. But researchers in the 1990s are also especially to blame. So forensic psychologists went into prisons and other institutions like mental health facilities and they focused on the individuals involved in the most serious sexual offenses. In fact, they often selected individuals specifically because they had a prior history of sexual offending. So they had committed multiple sexual offenses in the past. And then they came out with the conclusion that, oh, well, about 90% of individuals that have sexually offended have sexually recidivated. And so basically they set up their research design. I'm not saying they did this intentionally, but they just weren't thinking hard enough about how they were conducting their studies and they basically selected only the individuals that have sexually recidivated or had really serious sexual offenses. And what we're finding more and more is that because sexual offending includes such a wide range of behaviors, when we look at the typical individual or a more generalizable sample of individuals involved in sexual offenses, we find that they're not actually particularly likely to sexually reoffend. So here's something that's really important. In our own research, what we found is that about 80% of the sexual offenses committed by individuals in adulthood are committed by individuals that had no prior history of sexual offending in adolescence. So this dispels the myth that like the child sexual offender becomes the adult sexual offender. Also is really problematic because let's say we develop a policy where we're gonna focus on youth that have committed a sexual offense and we're gonna put them on a sex offender registry so that we can help prevent sexual offenses in the future. Well, let's say if we were able to prevent all of these individuals from committing a sexual offense in the future. Well, those individuals are only amounting to about 20% of all sex crimes in adulthood anyways. So what that means is that 80% of sexual offenses will go unprevented because we're gonna be looking at adults who typically they would have a history of non-sexual offending and then they escalate towards sexual offenses in adulthood. So this is one of the big problems we have in research is trying to dispel this myth that individuals will continue to sexually offend at a high rate over the life course. Another problem that we have is that we tend to rely on official data. So if you recall back to one of the first lectures of the semester where I talked about self-report surveys versus official data. And what we're beginning to find, and this was especially thanks to research during the feminist movement in the 1960s and 70s, is that sexual offending isn't just confined to individuals with an official criminal history. When researchers went into colleges and they began to ask questions of undergraduate students about whether they engaged in sexual offenses, especially when looking at victimization surveys, these researchers were finding a couple of things. They would find that 
women were reporting at a very high rate experiences of sexual victimization and there were individuals in these undergraduate classes reporting involvement in sexual offenses that had gone undetected by police. So we do have an issue with an inability to understand the true prevalence of sexual offending if we rely solely on official data. Earlier I talked about the psychiatrization of sexual offending where we focus almost exclusively on the deviant sexual interests of that particular individual. And this is uh, also relatively inaccurate perspective because rape and other sexual offenses can be about control and dominance and humiliation. And individuals that have perpetrated war crimes provide particularly strong evidence of this. During World War II, Japan invaded China and committed what's known as the Rape of Nanjing, where it's estimated to be at least 40,000 individuals, but maybe closer to even 300,000 Chinese citizens were killed and more than 20,000 persons were sexually assaulted over just a six week period. So the amount of sexual offenses committed in these six weeks was more than what we would see in Canada over a 52 week period. So this was during World War II and the atrocities that Japan was committing against China were so severe that Germany, this is Hitler's Germany, thought it was so severe that they actually formed an alliance in China and to try and stop individuals from Japan from perpetrating these sexual offenses against Chinese citizens. And one of the reasons why we believe that this was not just about deviant sexual interest was because the sexual offenses were perpetrated virtually against any person. And so what this illustrates is that if we suspect that the majority of individuals are heterosexual and have sexual preferences for someone of the opposite sex or has a sexual orientation towards someone of the opposite sex, then it leaves unexplained why they were perpetrating sexual offenses against children and against males. And the most reasonable explanation here is that it was also about power and dominance and control, not just about sexual interests or fulfilling sexual pleasure. When we look at the key characteristics of individuals that have perpetrated sexual offenses, although individuals that perpetrate sexual offenses are typically young, which is true of all types of offenses, when it comes to sexual offenses, specifically sexual offenses against children, such as possession or distribution of child pornography and then perpetrating actual hands-on sexual offenses against children, we see that individuals can also be on the older end where we can see 50 year old, 60 year old, especially males perpetrating these types of sexual offenses. When it comes to key risk factors for sexual offending, some of the more important ones are sexual abuse, attitudes towards women, so if individuals hold rape myths or general patriarchal dominance over women attitudes, that's where we can see an increased risk for sexual offending. But where we also see an increased risk for sexual offending is exactly the same way we see a risk for general offending. So individuals who hold general antisocial attitudes, they don't care about the well-being of others, they use drugs and alcohol, they have criminogenic peers. These individuals are also at risk of perpetrating sexual offenses. And then finally, what we'll also talk about later in lecture, and we'll actually watch a couple of videos as well, is paraphilia, specifically pedophilia, as a particular type of sexual deviancy that can increase the risk for sexual offending. When it comes to victim characteristics, victims also tend to be younger, and we're more likely to see a younger victim than a younger offender because we can very often see children as the victims but very unlikely meet the perpetrators of sexual offenses. We also tend to find that individuals that perpetrate sexual offenses tend to know the victim. The idea of stranger danger is a little bit unfounded. But we see in Canada and the United States a lot of current sexual offender laws are based on individuals that have committed sexual offenses against strangers. So for example, Megan's Law was an example of a really brutal sexual offense perpetrated against a stranger child. And so this again gives the public the idea that sexual offenses when they do occur tend to involve two strangers. The victim and the offender did not actually know one another and the risk or the so what we're seeing here is that these laws tend to give the general public the impression that the victim and the offender must have been complete strangers, but the research is actually saying that individuals who perpetrate a sexual offense against a victim tend to have had some prior relationship 
with that victim. Not saying relationship like an intimate relationship, just that they knew one, one another in some capacity. So once again, when we're talking about victim characteristics, we have to be careful to understand that these are just factors that can increase the likelihood of victimization, but they do not mean that the victim is at fault or in any way to blame for the offense actually occurring. So some of the things that we can see that are more common amongst victims that experience sexual offenses include that they have consumed alcohol prior to the offense occurring. Such individuals can be more risk-taking, and this refers more so to the fact that they have difficulty with specific specific risk recognition. So they might be able to identify that something is a risk, like walking down that alleyway is a risk. They don't feel that that risk is actually applicable to them. And so that's what can put them at risk of experiencing victimization. And again, that doesn't mean that they are to blame, but we can begin to understand how these events actually occur. <laughs> the traditions of sex offending research, maybe more than any research on any other type of offending, has been an emphasis on creating typology. So you'll recall at the beginning of the class it talked about perpetrators of sexual offending as a heterogeneous group. It's hard to characterize them by a single word. So typologies have been created for the specific purpose of accounting for this heterogeneity by dividing individuals into different groups. So what are some characteristics that help us classify perpetrators of sex offenses into more homogenous groups? Darwin and his sort of like origin of the species was the first to sort of approach this typological approach. Like how do we classify different animals into their different groups? So for sex offending research, the approach has been how do we classify different perpetrators of sexual offenses into specific subgroups so that we can make general conclusions about individuals within that subgroup? And one of the ways that they've traditionally done this is through victim typologies. So what is the nature of a perpetrator of a sex offense against a child versus a sex offense against a woman versus a sexual offense against a man? The problem with these initial typologies, however, was that they were far too simplified. The reason why they're simplified is because, for example, some people that perpetrate sexual offenses against children do not actually have a sexual orientation towards children. Most adolescents that perpetrate sex offenses against children actually show a sexual orientation towards individuals who are of an opposite sex and who are post-puberty. So just because an adolescent sexually offends against a child does not mean that they have a sexual preference for children or an orientation towards children. And this becomes really important to clarify when we begin to look at paraphilias such as pedophilia. A difficulty with looking at the motivation of sexual offending is that it's sometimes difficult to figure out what an individual's actual motivation is because they can be very deceitful about what their true intention is to commit a sexual offense and they might use rationalizations rather than explaining their true motivation. One of the major typologies to come out of the sex offending research is from research conducted on individuals from the Massachusetts Treatment Center. And Raymond Knight was the lead author on this paper that looked at the different typologies of sexual offenders that came into that treatment facility. And he said that there were three types. There was the individuals that experienced physical or verbal abuse as a child or as an adolescent. And this led to a lack of empathy or remorse. These individuals were sort of like that factor one of the PCL. They were manipulative. They had interpersonal and affective deficits that really influenced their involvement in sexual offenses. They simply did not care about the well-being of others. Then they described a second type that more so resembled the factor two of the PCLYV or the PCLR. So what that means is that these are individuals that showed more of the antisocial traits. They are impulsive, irresponsible, stimulation seeking, and this led to them seeking out opportunities to engage in different types of offenses including the perpetration of sexual offenses. The third typology focuses on experiences of sexual abuse and how experience of sexual abuse can lead to sexual preoccupation. This is where individuals develop hypersexuality, where they're constantly thinking about sexual experiences, and they begin to connect their sexual abuse 
with sexual deviancy and wanting to feel what it's like to also harm someone sexually. So you can see from like our week four discussions of social learning theory, how these individuals may have observed others being rewarded for the perpetration of sexually harmful behavior and wanted to perpetrate this behavior as well. Some other key typologies include Finkelhor's model, which was more about child sexual abuse as key to this explanation. The Knight model tended to focus more so on males that perpetrated sexual offenses against women. Ray Knight's model tended to focus on sexual offenses perpetrated against women, whereas Finkelhor was more interested in developing a typology of individuals that perpetrated sexual abuse against children. So he came up with four explanations or motivations for why an individual would perpetrate a sex offense against a child. The first referred to emotional congruence. So this is where the individual maybe was developmentally delayed or had very poor social skills and felt more comfortable interacting with children compared to interacting with adults. And this emotional congruence influenced their perpetration of a sexual thing. The second type in this typology was sexual arousal where the individual simply had a sexual orientation towards children and this influenced their perpetration of a sex thing. The blockage explanation of sexual offending referred to how an individual maybe was unable, let's say they're sexually attracted to post-pubescent females, but they were unable to have opportunities for consensual sexual interactions with women. So they turn to different opportunities or search for, for example, more vulnerable victims. So these individuals may have especially low self-esteem and they perpetrate their sex offense against a child because of that. The fourth type is disinhibition or drug use, where they simply they don't have any sexual preoccupation regarding children, but because of the effects of drugs or alcohol, their inhibitions are lowered and they perpetrate a sex offense against a child. Most of these typologies have been very psychologically oriented, but Steedle and Barbary's model drew upon Terry Moffat's Adolescent Limited and Life Course Persistent Explanation of Sexual Offending. Pseudo Barbary's developmental model focused on three different types that were kind of resembling Moffat's AL and LCP offending patterns. So the Adolescent Limited path is just like what Moffat described, where individuals are attempting to bridge the maturity gap. So those individuals who have committed a sex offense maybe once in the context of a sexual offense against a peer age victim including in the context or an, ex an example date rape. The antisociality path resembled Moffat's life course persistent offending pattern and also represented or resembled Finkel Hoare's description of the blockage path where these individuals were developing risk factors over the life course that would limit their opportunities for consensual sexual interactions because they wouldn't be a suitable partner. They wouldn't be an attractive partner, have difficulty with self-esteem, getting dates, and so they may perpetrate sexual offenses as part of a general antisocial behavioral pattern. So they would engage in a wide range of different sexual offenses and would engage in a wide range of general offenses in overall. The pedophilia path described by Cito and Barbary would be the example of an individual with a specific sexual orientation towards children and they perpetrate their sexual offense because of this orientation. Some major critiques of typologies is that they're often atheoretical. So remember when I talked about risk assessment tools and actuarial risk assessment where they just sort of throw risk factors into a model and see what would come out. This has been true of these typological models as well maybe the exception of Cito and Barbary, who are relying on Moffat's theoretical perspective to develop their own ideas about the pathways to sexual offending. But part of the problem with these typologies is they don't explain the causal mechanisms behind, for example, why does somebody with features of psychopathy engage in sexual offending, or why does child sexual abuse lead to sexual offending? And understanding these causal mechanisms is key to our understanding, but also how we develop prevention and treatment strategies. As a way to try and address the lack of theoretical perspectives or the lack of theory integrated into typological research, Marshall and Barbary developed their integrated theory where the focus was on how do we explain, how do we go from a child that experiences a wide range of risk factors to the adult or the adolescent that perpetrates a sexual offense. So for Marshall and Barbary, we needed to integrate a bunch of different factors, including parenting styles, abuse, 
and what we understand about the development of, of aggression and self-esteem. So they basically said the reason why someone sexually offends is because of the fusion of sex with aggression. And this occurs because an individual experiences sexual abuse and then never learns how to disassociate that sexual abuse with sexual pleasure. So the individual as a child is expected by Marshall and Barbary to experience parental neglect. So poor parenting strategies, a lack of attachment between the parent and the child can lead to the child engaging in general antisocial behavior that can further lead to this sort of divide between parent and child. So this emotional detachment from the child by the parent. And this is what leads to low social competency. So this child will have difficulty interacting with others because their parent never really taught them how to share their toys or get along with others or learn to collaborate rather than just act on their own or bully others into getting what they want. And by doing this, this somewhat isolates the child. They don't develop that peer group. They don't develop people looking out for them. And this can lead to social isolation, which can put them at risk of sexual abuse. And once experiencing this sexual abuse, these individuals don't have the emotional attachments or connections to others that can help them process and deal with the sexual abuse experience. And so the result is that this individual basically becomes like their abuser and they will seek out opportunities to engage in sexual offenses against vulnerable victims. Because they have poor social skills due to the experience of poor parenting and their sexual abuse experiences and social isolation, they develop this level of poor self-esteem that makes it difficult for them to engage in pro-social and consensual sexual relationships or dating relationships. And so as a consequence, they use sexually coercive methods in the context of dating in order to experience those, that sexual gratification. So for Marshall and Barbary, it's this confluence of factors in childhood and adolescence that can lead to sexual offending. On the other hand, there are also general theories that basically say that the reason why people perpetrate sex offenses is the same as why people perpetrate all types of offenses. So just like how we talked last week about why people engage in violent offense. According to a general theoretical perspective, Sexual offenses is just a manifestation of a general antisocial tendency. These individuals tend to engage in harmful behavior towards others, and sexual offending is just one other type of harmful behavior. So we can explain sexual offending the same way we explain property offending. The reality is probably that sometimes general theories are useful, and sometimes specific theories like Marshall and Barbary's are useful. Definitely though, when we think about it, the vast majority of individuals that perpetrate a sex offense don't go on to continue to sexually offend. So maybe there isn't something really specific or unique about perpetrators of sexual offense. It can be, for example, just that confluence of a general antisocial attitude or propensity and the opportunity to perpetrate a sex offense or the disinhibition against perpetrating a sex offense. <laughs>
in people who are just like on the verge of puberty. So maybe they're beginning to display secondary sex characteristics, but they haven't gone through puberty in its full extent. Others will engage in sexual sadism, where there's the preference for seeing the suffering of another person. Whereas masochism is the preference for experiencing pain during sexual intercourse or other sexual activity. So for, this is a very clear example, masochism is, of where paraphilia is not necessarily criminal if the individual is consenting to this experience. Frauderism involves the rubbing up against an unconsenting person. And this can happen, for example, in the context of riding public transit. Exhibitionism usually involves displaying genitals to another person, typically an unconsenting person. And voyeurism, which would involve spying on somebody who does not consent to being spied upon. Not all individuals that commit sexual offenses against children have a sexual attraction to children. So when it comes to pedophilia, there are very specific diagnostic criteria. So just like all paraphilias, the symptoms of pedophilia have to be present for at least six months. They have to be recurrent and intense. So it's not as if they have one sexual thought at month one and another at month six, and this counts as the definition of pedophilia. So these have to cause intense arousal, usually towards someone that's 13 or younger, that is somebody who is a prepubescent child, and the person has to have acted on these sexual urges, or these urges or fantasies cause severe interpersonal activity to the extent that they cannot, for example, go outside or walk by a park without feeling these intense sexual urges. The person that is the receiving the diagnosis of pedophilia has to be at least age 16. The reason being is that we can be concerned that individuals younger than this still have a developing sexual orientation and so maybe they won't actually display these features later on in adulthood. Or they can be so young that the sexual attraction to somebody at age 12 or 11 years old is relatively normative because they're 13 years old or something like that. So we have to be careful about how we label children. When we look at the development of pedophilia, it's very clear from the research that this is a biological disorder, that it's genetic in nature. We can see some very common characteristics amongst perpetrators of sexual offenses who have been diagnosed with pedophilia. They tend to be shorter on average there is an increased likelihood of being left-handed. It's believed that there's a cross-wiring of gray matter in the brain that pairs the desire to show like care for another person with the sexual interest. There's a pairing of the desire to be like a parent or a caregiver and actual sexual interest in that person. So how do we find out if somebody has pedophilic sexual interest, especially because this is an incredibly stigmatizing label. People will be very unlikely to be forthcoming about these pedophilic sexual interests. So what the research does is use penile plasmographs, which essentially is a device that detects blood flow to the penis and then pairs this device with images of children or it can involve epithets of a description of an interaction with the child. So very important to point out, they're not actually showing these individuals sexually graphic images of children. This would be horrifically, this would be just a complete violation of ethics and it would also be a criminal offense to be in possession of these images. So it's simply like neutral images of children but they detect whether or not the individual connected to the penile plasmograph is showing a sexual attraction to the child. And so this is how, this is one of the ways in which pedophilia is assessed and diagnosed. The Dunkerfield Project is a somewhat controversial to some projects that started in Berlin, where there are no mandatory reporting laws regarding a person's desire to engage in sex with a child or to commit a sexual offense. In Canada, if a person tells their therapist that they have sexual interest in a particular child, the clinician is required by law to inform police about this. This creates a bit of a challenge. How do we make sure that people with pedophilia get treatment to prevent them from perpetrating sexual offenses if we also require the acknowledgement of pedophilia be reported by the clinician? So basically, 
people aren't going to disclose their paraphilia if that disclosure is automatically going to result in criminal charges. In Canada, we have Alcoholics Anonymous, where somebody can say, I think that I might take a drink. I would like to talk to somebody about this so that I don't relapse. But we don't have anything similar for individuals who are thinking about perpetrating sexual offenses. So in Germany, the idea was to work on accepting the fact that this is a true sexual orientation and we need to provide treatment and intervention. On the other hand, it's also really clear that we have to communicate that acting on features of pedophilia is a criminal offense. It is wrong, it is extremely damaging to the child, to the child's family. And so the individual with pedophilia is responsible for their behavior. Just because they have this disorder does not make it okay that they commit sexual harm against others. And that's where some of this miscommunication and controversy can come from. The project isn't about excusing the behavior of individuals with pedophilia because it's a genetic disorder. The goal of the project is to say, okay, we need to make sure we give these individuals help so that they don't perpetrate an offense. They have to take responsibility for their behavior, but we want to help them with that. We want to give them some therapies so they're able to be better in control of their disorder and therefore better able to not commit a sex offense. So the Dunkerfeld Project made contact with about 800 men in the first four years and individuals from actually all over Europe came to Berlin to take part in this project. So people from England, Austria, Switzerland, all traveled to Berlin to receive this therapy where about two thirds of individuals were diagnosed with pedophilia and another third were diagnosed with hemophilia. Three quarters of individuals reported at least one form of experience of child sexual abuse as well. So this was a very important project for understanding like how prevalent is pedophilia. And what they discovered was close to like between one and 3% of all men present with pedophilic sexual interest. And we need to make sure that we don't excuse their behavior ever, but we also need to make sure that they receive help to try and prevent them from actually acting on their sexual orientation. In BC, there are no preventative services for persons that are at risk of sexual offending. Patrick Lussier and I wanted to get a better understanding of, for example, in BC, would this be a service that would be useful for individuals with sexual interest in ch children. Currently, in BC, the only way to treat somebody with illegal sexual fantasies is to wait until they commit a sexual offense. And this just seems like a horrible system. We shouldn't be waiting until somebody perpetrates harm to try and then prevent future harm. We should be trying to be much more proactive preventing a sexual offense from ever occurring in the first place. And remember, if most people don't continue to sexually offend, they sexually offend once and then never again, all of these reactive criminal policies are not gonna help us reduce very much of the harm that's experienced by victims. Because once the individual has been caught and receives treatment, it's very unlikely that they're going to do this behavior in the first place. So our goal should be proactive in preventing the first occurrence of the behavior as opposed to responding after the first occurrence of the behavior. We sent out surveys to approximately 100 men in the Lower Mainland, and the majority reported worrying about their own sexual fantasies. Some reported thoughts about rape or perpetrating in general child sexual abuse. Over 80% of individuals said that they felt that preventative services would be helpful in preventing their involvement in sexual offenses and that they would use these services. So this does seem like something that would be worthwhile, but at present we can't implement this type of program because it would be a violation of Canadian laws because as soon as somebody mentioned that they were having specific interest in perpetrating offenses against a specific person, they would have to be informed upon by their clinician, specifically the clinician would have to tell police about what they said. patterns of offending actually look like amongst perpetrators of sexual offenses. So this graph here is showing individuals that have perpetrated a sex offense as a juvenile. So we'll refer them to them as JSOs, juveniles with sexual offenses. And what you're seeing along the x-axis is a person's age. And what you're seeing along the y-axis 
is the basically the average number of convictions that a person with a sex offense would receive in that particular year. And the different colors represent different crime types. So you can see at the bottom in kind of that like ocean green shade is violations of court orders. In the puke green shade, you're seeing property offenses. And then in that sort of very sort of forest green shade, you can see sexual offenses. So remember, this is a sample entirely of persons that have committed sexual offenses, but the vast majority of their offending is non-sexual in nature. For these individuals, only about 15-20% go on to perpetrate a sex offense in adulthood. And so the vast majority of sex offenses committed in adulthood are committed by individuals with no prior history of sex offending as an adolescent. You can see for these juveniles who have had a history of sexual offending, they're continuing to engage in crimes in adulthood, but these crimes tend to be of a non-sexual nature. So if we want to prevent sexual offending in adolescents, we need to focus on proactive prevention. Remember we talked last week about primary intervention strategies. That's the type of intervention strategy that's going to help prevent sexual offending in adolescents. I talked about the likelihood of adult sexual recidivism already. I mentioned that most studies find that with a five-year window, only about 10% of adults who've committed a sex offense commit a new sexual offense. That hasn't stopped places in the United States, particularly from implementing sex offender registries that require individuals to, for example, inform their neighbors that they have a sexual offense. It bans them from working certain jobs or requires them to inform employers about their past history of sex offense. It can require an individual to live in a specific area or more specifically, they have to live a certain number of miles away from particular parks, schools, and so on. And this can actually end up confining individuals to very, very poor neighborhoods or in places like underneath of bridges because there's nowhere else that there's actually a lack of parks and schools and so on. Let's recall the work of Samson Love in their discussion of informal social controls and turning points. Employment is supposed to be a really key factor that can help people from stopping to offend. But sex offender registries basically almost prohibit an individual from being able to get a job. Similarly, it can prohibit an individual from having a stable residence. So these are things that are supposed to prevent people from engaging in crime, but sex offender registries basically try to take these things away. I can understand why people would be angry to even hear me talk about this because you might confuse it with me trying to say like, we need to give these individuals a second chance or have empathy or take pity on them because of these really harsh laws. And I'm not saying you have to feel that way. What I'm saying is that if you care about preventing future harm against victims, then we should throw political ideologies out the window and think about what does the literature and what does the research have to say about the things that we should do to make sure a person doesn't commit harm against another. And if the research is saying that we should not prohibit individuals from getting a job or from living in a specific area, then we need to begin to think about how existing policies are actually harmful and can increase the likelihood that somebody is going to experience victimization down the road. I'm also not saying that everybody deserves a second chance. I've interviewed kids who have committed sexual homicide offenses and my personal opinion is that they will, for the rest of their life, remain at risk of committing crimes against others and doing real serious damage to other people, other victims. And so for me, I think these individuals maybe should be incarcerated indefinitely. So I think that there is a role of really punitive punishment, but the way that existing policies work is to assign basically everyone who's committed a sex offense to the sex offender registry. And when we know that the vast majority of these individuals are at a low risk of sexually offending in the first place, maybe the registry isn't that appropriate for them and maybe it can actually increase the risk of future offending. One group that has been particularly neglected in the research on sexual offending is women that have perpetrated sexual offenses. Initially, it was the perspective that women simply did not do such things. Later on, the perspective was that only women with very, very severe mental disorders would possibly engage in a sexual offense. After that, the perspective was that 
Women would only perpetrate a sex offense if they were coerced by a male partner to perpetrate this sex offense. And one thing that I hope you notice about these descriptions of female sexual offending is that they're very patriarchal. Initially, it was like women couldn't possibly do such a thing because their role is as caregiver. And so they would never engage in a sexual offense because it's kind of like the antithesis to their entire biological and social role. Then it was only, well, they had to have a mental disorder that would sort of displace their responsibility as a caregiving person. And then it was that they don't have autonomy because men have complete control or dictate their behavior. So basically all of these perspectives have diminished the role of the actual perpetrator in engaging in this crime. And it's not for reasons of like, maybe they not, aren't actually responsible. It's more misogynistic attitudes that have stereotyped women. More recently, studies using official data have shown that female sexual offending is more prevalent than previously thought in that women can actually comprise about 2% of all officially reported sex crimes. And this is likely a big underestimation because the research is also suggesting that individuals that experience sexual victimization that was perpetrated by a woman are less likely to report that sexual victimization. In a study in San Diego of like 10,000 individuals, of those that reported experiencing sexual victimization, about 40% reported that the assailant was a woman. Women do perpetrate sexual offenses and some of the risk factors for perpetrating this type of sexual offense are similar to those for why adult males perpetrate sexual offenses. This includes physical and sexual abuse coming from a negative family environment or where there's a lot of poor parenting, dysfunction and so on. Or the individual is in a position of power, such as being a babysitter, that allows them the opportunity to engage in a sexual offense against a vulnerable victim. The last topic I'll touch on about sexual offending refers to sexual homicide. In this case, the vast, vast majority of perpetrators are men. These offenses typically occur in somebody's home. The vast majority of individuals that experience this sexual homicide victimization are women. And about one out of every five sexual homicide offenses goes unsolved. One of the main perspectives on why sexual homicide occurs is that individuals have very strong features of psychopathy. Eric Beauregard, who basically has written the book on sexual homicide research, has shown that definitely it's true that psychopathy plays a major role, but there's also a lot of evidence that individuals have perpetrated sexual offenses without any evidence of features of psychopathy. They may have paraphilias or they may kill the victim as a means of trying to avoid detection. And so it's not necessarily the role of psychopathy, but the role of trying to cover up the actual offense that's been perpetrated. But when incidents do involve psychopathy, these incidents tend to be more gratuitous. So the level of violence is more severe and the level of violence is more likely to be sadistic. So the individual is bringing harm to the person specifically as part of sexual gratification, as opposed to bringing harm to the person as a means to try and ensure that they're not going to get caught for the crime that they're perpetrating. And lastly, I'll briefly touch on family violence and abuse. Family violence is one of those things that's been neglected by criminological research and other research because historically family violence was quasi-legitimate. One of the, like a very archaic phrase that we probably shouldn't use anymore is rule of thumb. The term rule of thumb came from this idea that men were allowed to beat their children and beat their partner as long as the stick that they were using was not more wide than the width of their thumb. Traditionally, and it's obviously not okay, but traditionally the perpetration of violence against children and women was justified under law. And now fortunately we've obviously moved away from those things, but that's why this research on intimate partner violence has really emerged relatively recently. And the reason why family violence was initially sort of viewed as quasi-legitimate was because of beliefs in the subservient roles of women and children. Children, especially from the start of the 1900s onwards, uh, maybe until around the 1960s, 
really weren't viewed as children. They were just viewed as miniature adults who were there to help on the farms or help in uh, industrial warehouses. They were expected to bring home an income to help families feed uh, the rest of the family and put food on the table. So fortunately in the 1960s and 70s, thanks to the women's liberation movement, began to say like, no, this is not okay. And the research being conducted at this time and still today has shown that about half of women report that they've experienced intimate partner violence. And in fact, when we're looking at high school samples in BC, boys are actually also reporting the experience of intimate partner violence just as often as girls. Now, girls tend to experience more severe forms of intimate partner violence, but some research is showing, in fact, that boys are more likely to experience relational violence compared to girls. What's also important to clarify is that violence against an intimate partner or against a family member doesn't always have to just be physical violence. And this can include psychological and emotional neglect or abuse, physical violence, sexual violence, financial violence, which I wouldn't really refer to as violence, but it can be a type of abuse where the individual is, say, taking their partner's money or refusing to provide them with money as a way of maintaining control over that person. Like research on sexual offending, there's also been research developing typologies of male perpetrators of spousal violence. And these typologies have focused on three particular subgroups. The first is what they call the family-only batterer. So this individual is not otherwise involved in criminal behavior, but perpetrates different types of family violence or abuse against members of their family. Then there is the individual that's explained more by that general antisocial tendency. This individual is just generally violent and aggressive, and this leads to perpetration of violence in the home as well. The dysphoric borderline batterer is at risk to their partner, but also their partner's family or individuals that they may date in the future. So this individual has this irrational or unjustified feeling that their partner is cheating on them or is unfaithful or is going to leave them. So they might engage in stalking behavior or show up unexpectedly at work, cause scenes and so on. Much like bipolar disorder, which we talked about in our week on mental disorders, this individual can go through extreme highs and lows. So when they're with their partner, they might talk about how much they love them, or even when their partner is trying to leave them, they might overreact and act very affectionate towards them. But then they'll also have extreme lows and very bad behavior, belief in partner cheating on them, having low self-esteem, and so on. So that's everything for this week, but stay tuned. 30 seconds from now, I'm going to include two videos for you to watch as part of both the lecture and the tutorial discussion. There'll be questions posed on Canvas, of Canvas, about these two videos for you to respond to. Thanks everyone, and we'll see you next week. I wish people understood that, I mean, we generally don't like the fact that there are pedophiles either. Like, we didn't ask for this. It's something that a lot of people will be more comfortable ignoring, but when it's you, it's not really an option to ignore it. This is David. He's known as a non-offending pedophile. Someone who has a romantic and sexual attraction to kids, but says he's never abused a child. He wants help, but getting it in the U.S. is risky. When I was figuring this stuff out about myself, I decided that I couldn't tell anybody because I was pretty certain that at best they would like desert me and just like I'd lose a friend or whatever, and at worst, like they'd tell absolutely everybody, and I'd be like, "It'd be dangerous for you." It, it would be dangerous.
We've never thought about non-offending pedophiles. We focused all of our resources on after-the-fact interventions. How do we punish? How do we surveil? How do we keep track of sex offenders? What we need are interventions that can target the vast majority of sex crimes that can be prevented. Dr. Letourneau is one of few researchers in the U.S. focusing on preventive measures to help pedophiles. But getting them treatment is tough. Mandatory reporting laws in America require that therapists alert authorities when they suspect a pedophile is at risk of abusing a child. If you are someone that has an attraction and you go to a therapist and you say, I have these attractions for young people, what could happen? Any number of things could happen. Even if you've never offended, if you're sexually interested in children, you reach out to a therapist for help, they may decide that you still represent a threat and that their concerns meet the threshold for a mandatory report. I know of a child who's at the age of 15 disclosed to a school guidance counselor that he had sexual interest in young children and he wanted some help and support around that. He got kicked out of school and they assumed, as many people do assume, that someone with sexual interest in children, that they cannot control themselves, that they will just reach out and grab the first child they see off the street and rape that child. And that's not true. This is a PSA you're not likely to see in the U.S. Do you like children in ways you shouldn't? There is help. The campaign was produced by Prevention Project Dunkelfeld, one of the only places in the world that offers therapy to pedophiles. We do not have these mandatory port laws as you have in the United States. Yes. This is an obstacle for prevention work because nobody would show up. Since 2005, about 10,000 people in Germany have reached out to Dunkelfeld for help. Is this like conversion therapy? Are you trying to cure these people? No, it's not possible to change sexual orientation. I never would try that. So are you saying that pedophilia is a sexual orientation? Exactly. We have a lot of sexual minorities and this is all part of this huge variety. So nobody chooses this. And as long as he not would act out, it would be very, very inhuman to judge such a person. And I would always vote to integrate him in society. Dr. Bauer estimates that 1% of the population is pedophilically inclined. And nearly all of them are men. But not all of them offend. Dunkelfels treated about 1,700 since it opened. And what does this treatment look like? It's a kind of cognitive behavioral treatment running to all the risky situations. And then we will train him to change his behavior in these situations. The other one would be pharmaceutical options. We can lower sexual urges with very effective drugs. So if it's... Is that like chemical castration? It's like chemical castration, yeah. How many people have gone through this program and have not offended? Nearly all of them. How do you measure that? By just uh, giving the... Um, taking the answers of them. It's subject. Oh, so they tell you? Yes. Doctor, is that, is that, if you're just relying on them to tell you that they didn't act out as the only measurement of success for this program, yeah. is that enough? As long as we do not have any other measurements and we are working on this. Do you feel like you were born this way? Basically, yes. Just imagine to feel whatever you may feel for women or men, to feel that romance and sexual attraction, just not to adults, but to kids. Ooh. Max, that's, that's tough, man. That's... I know, I know. When, when did you realize that you were attracted to kids? It was around 20. It kind of shattered my whole um, self image. I didn't know at that point that there was a way out. 
In 2006, Max went to Dunkelfeld for a year of treatment. Is there something you tell yourself when you see a young girl that you're attracted to? In therapy, I learned some strategies to make myself realize that what I'm feeling is very different from what the girl is feeling. I've arrived in my development at the point where I feel mostly completely normal about kids like other people would. I obviously still have the attraction, but it's on the background. Do you think you deserve the same rights as adults who are attracted to adults? If you exclude having sex with kids, yes. So you should be able to live where you want to live and work where you want to work, even if it's at a preschool or elementary school? Basically, yes. Because everything else would um, constitute something like uh, thought control. What does destigmatization look like? If I'm a pedophilically inclined, and you will come over and will say to me, listen, please take care of my five-year-old son. And I would say, no, I'm pedophilically inclined. And if you would judge this in the same way as you would judge the drug, drug addict, then that would be a sign of destigmatization. That's the, wor that's the world you want to live in? Yes. You got a tough job, Doc. Yes, correct. At some point last year, this article showed up in newspapers all over the world. The police had taken down this massive child pornography network. It was on the dark net and it had nearly 90,000 members. Lots and lots of illegal material was shared and lots of messages were sent through the network. Every day, every hour, every second. People from all over the world were logging into this network anonymously, which makes it extremely difficult for the police to track them down. Now, some of these people only had the aim of collecting child abuse and material online. Others also had the aim of abusing children themselves. Regardless, they all found this deep satisfaction in discussing their deepest fantasies and experiences with regards to child abuse online. Apparently, there's a market for this. Well, this makes me ask the question, how can we keep the world of the internet safe for our children? How can we reduce and maybe even eliminate the problem of child exploitation online? Well, that's quite a question to ask. As a psychologist, uh, having worked directly with sex offenders previously, and now working for the Dutch National Police Child Exploitation Unit, I can simply tell you this. Unfortunately, we will never be able to eliminate every possible risk out there. However, there are definitely ways of making the world of the internet a safer place for our children. And the criminal justice system is one solution, but if we want to do more, I need the help of all of you. And in the next 15 minutes or so, I will tell you exactly what we can do and why. But first, let's go back to the basics. At one point, a website was under law enforcement investigation on which 1.3 million images were available. And this is only one website. From experience, I can tell you many, many more websites have been online. So the internet really is a great thing, but it, it gives us lots of opp opportunities, but it does have a downside as well. Because every time that offender presses that send or post button, a victim is re-victimized. Every time that picture is multiplied, re-victimization occurs. It's not really surprising then that all, all law enforcement agencies report massive increases in cases in the last couple of years. Canada is even talking about 233% increase in the last 10 years. So the problem seems to be growing exponentially. And of course, we can partly explain this, this increase in the ease with which images are multiplied and the expansion of the internet. 
So we're not talking about absolute numbers of growth in offenders and, and victims, but still we're having a problem. Well, this may sound really shocking, but it's not really surprising considering that international research repeatedly portrays that 0.5 up to even 3% of our male population has some form of pedophilic interest. I'm talking about our male population here today because that's what most research is conducted on. I'm not saying that females don't have this difficulty at all, it's just few is known about them. But 0.5 up to 3%. Consider the Netherlands. We have 8.5 million men in total, so this percentage equates with 42,500 up to 255,000 men. That's all inhabitants of a medium-sized city in the Netherlands. To make it even more concrete, I was told that there's about 200 of you in the audience today. Well, looking at you, I think there's slightly more females than males, but let's say that there's 80 males of you here today in the audience. We can all do the maths now, can't we? Statistics indicate that there will be one or two of you who are struggling with some form of pedophilic interest. And what this means is that most probably there will be someone in your environment, someone you know, someone like your neighbor, like your colleague, like your football mate, maybe even your husband or son, who is struggling with these sort of feelings. The only thing is, you don't know about it. And here we get to a notion that I really want to emphasize. Because even though these percentages are massive, most of these people know that they have feelings that they should repress. So most of these people don't act out on it. They don't offend. Which is great, isn't it? But the problem is, these people can't talk about their feelings because they know that they will be hated for it. I truly do believe that every person is longing for love at some point in their life. And what if this love that you really wish for will forever be impossible? That must be a really lonely situation to be in. It's like telling me, we know that you love your boyfriend and we don't minimize this love. However, you cannot act out on it ever. And on top of that, you won't be able to talk about it with anyone. So unfortunately, sometimes it does go wrong. Sometimes people do start offending. And I'm not justifying this. On the contrary, I, I work for police. I'm just saying that it's a logical thing to happen. So what do we do with this knowledge? Well, I think there will be many of you telling me now, you know what, let's just ban all these people from society, let's just lock them all up and let's just leave them somewhere far away from our children. And from an emotional point of view, I can kind of understand what you're saying. I became a, an auntie last year for the first time. My little nephew, he, he just turned one absolutely crazy about the little boy and, and we just got back from a family holiday and we really enjoyed the sun and the beach, the weather was lovely and I simply cannot imagine the possibility that my little nephew wouldn't be able to walk around in his swimming wear because some adult would be sexually attracted to him. Yes, from an emotional point of view I can kind of understand that you want to, would want to eliminate these people from society. However, it doesn't make sense. And that's because we're talking about biology. We're talking about a sexual orientation. Something that we simply cannot change. And on top of that, every day new people are born with the same difficulty. So it's not practical to eliminate these people from society. They haven't done anything wrong. So rather than letting our emotions rule, Please, let's be mature about this problem. Let's think about clever solutions. Because most, more importantly, this pretended solution doesn't take into account the variation between offenders and offenses. What we think about when we hear about sex offenders is what we see portrayed in the media. 
And the media usually reports about the most extreme cases, the real violent offenders, those people that are portrayed as monsters and less than human. You may have heard about the case of Joseph Fritzl in Austria. He locked up his daughter in a cellar and abused her for years. Maybe you've heard about Robert M. in the Netherlands. He abused 83 children within the ages of zero and four in a daycare facility where he was working. I think most countries know a notorious case like that, and these are the type of cases that all our popular TV series are based on. And I can kind of understand that you would want to eliminate these type of people from society. But the problem is, this distorts our view of the factual situation. Because in fact, sex offenders aren't all those violent, gruesome men waiting in the bushes for children they can attack. On the contrary, research portrays that the great, great majority of children that are abused, I'm talking 70, 80, maybe even 90 percent, they're abused by someone they know someone close to them, someone from their neighborhood, their family, or their sports club. And now I hear you think, yeah, but you know what, whoever the offender, and whatever seriousness the crime, they should still all be punished for it. Yes. But what if this time the offender is your neighbor, your colleague, your football mate, what if this time the offender is your husband or son? What if this time the police shows up at your doorstep? I hear you think now, well, yeah, but I know my family, I know my friends, and it wouldn't happen, not in my backyard, not in my family. And this is because we tend to think in stigmas. We tend to think that people who would do this, they're either really pathetic, lonely men spending 24-7 on the internet waiting for children they can groom. Or they must be really psychopathic men, really violent, with no conscience whatsoever. I can tell you from experience, this stigma is simply not correct. In my career, I've seen sex offenders with a lot of life potential social, charismatic men, men with no psychological disorders whatsoever, men with jobs, with wives, men you wouldn't ever believe to get in trouble with the police at all. Men like your football mate, like your neighbor, men like your colleague or your husband or your son. Where I'm heading at is, we shouldn't think about this problem only from a criminal justice perspective. Yes, definitely, law enforcement is a great solution, repression is a great solution, but it isn't always the right one. Of course, when someone has committed a lot of offenses and doesn't ever intend to stop, we should punish them. But the criminal justice system has always meant to have been a last resort, and we should keep it that way. Think about this 18-year-old who took a nude picture of his 15-year-old girlfriend and then shares it with a friend who sends it to the whole school. Yes, definitely, we should have a proper conversation with them. But should they really learn the hard way? Should they have a criminal record for the rest of their lives? What about this 20-year-old? silently been struggling for a couple of years now with pedophilic feelings and who is now thinking about approaching children online. Don't you think that someone like that would be better off if we were willing to speak to him? If we were willing to help? If we would want to listen and help him towards treatment? Consider this example. A couple of years ago, I was speaking at a conference, after which I got approached by a lady, and she had a five-year-old daughter who just received love letter and flowers from a guy who was living in their area. Well, what this lady already did was she went over to the guy's house. He was in his mid or late 30s. She spoke to him, and it turned out that indeed he was really in love with the little girl, and he couldn't hide it no longer. 
She spoke to him. She had a really good conversation. And she convinced him to find psychological help. And what she asked me was, shouldn't I be concerned now? I'm really worried now to let my child play on the street. Well, I can completely understand, definitely. But what I told her was, at least now you know where the dangers are. And now you can manage this risk. Maybe you've prevented this guy from starting to commit crimes at the first place. Point five, up to three percent. There's many, many, many more people struggling with these feelings. We just don't know where they are. I can assure you that law enforcement is working really, really hard every day to get a grip on this problem. There's a great focus on prioritization and working on the most dangerous offenders, the most extreme cases. And to get back to the newspaper article that I showed you in the beginning, I started with a bit of a negative vibe, because I wanted to make you aware of the problem that we're facing. But at the same time, behind the scenes, law enforcement is working really hard. They're professionalizing and working together internationally to really get a grip on the tip of the iceberg of people active on these networks. And I must say, I'm really proud. However, we can do so much more. And in order to do so, I need your help of every single one of you out there. Because law enforcement only is not going to arrest their way out of this problem. And that's because we're talking about a public and a mental health issue, which is a shared responsibility for all of us. So please, let's be open about the problem. Let's acknowledge that this problem exists and let's make sure that people will find the strength to come forward. The biggest mistake is to say that it won't happen in my area because that is to deny the problem because it happens everywhere. We've all seen the hashtag MeToo discussion, haven't we? We never thought that this was such a big issue until people started to step forward. And then the problem portrayed itself in all its varieties. So how can we be open about a problem now? How can we break the taboo? Well, first of all, let's stop with hate. Let's stop with negative vibes in the media. And let's stop with throwing rocks at offenders' houses. Because it's not going to take us anywhere. It's never going to solve this problem. But rather, please, let's be rational about this problem. Let's talk about it. Let's be open and let's be a mature society. What if your son would approach you one day and would tell you that he's struggling with pedophilic feelings? Would you beat him up? Or would you want to help? It's only with this openness that people will find the strength to come forward and that people will find the help they need. And I truly do believe that this will bring us one step closer to prevention. However, as for me, if this talk or even my daily job helps to saving only just one child, for me, that's a solution in itself. Thank you very much. <laughs>